Um, okay, so where I left off last time was I gave you a, a history of some of the terms uh, around uh, Holocaust, Shoah, genocide, crimes against humanity, terms that were used uh, both uh, at the time in which uh, what we now know to be the Holocaust was uh, taking place and terms that also were used subsequently to try to describe what was happening. And uh, the particular term that I want to focus on at the beginning of the lecture today is genocide. And uh, this is a significant term uh, for us for a number of reasons. One particular reason is that it's a term that came directly out of the experience of the Holocaust. It was a term that was basically a neologism coined in 1944 in order to describe the destruction or killing of an entire race. Um, I had mentioned before that there were other genocides in the 20th century prior uh, to the Holocaust and mentioned in particular the one that Samantha Powers begins with, which is the Armenian Genocide in 1915, perpetrated by the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish uh, majority, a Muslim majority, against its Christian Armenian citizens, a genocide that in many ways is considered the first modern genocide because of the fact that people were essentially deported using means of transportation like railways and were killed in mass or starved in mass in a very short period of time. So this is not to say that prior to the 20th century there were no genocides, uh, that is to say killing of people in mass or uh, killing based on race, but during the 20th century what you had is the acceleration of the means to do so and you have a kind of systematic approach to carrying out a genocide. And this systematic approach is often rooted in racist ideas and particularly scientific racist ideas about the superiority of a race and the inferiority of another. And this is very significant because this is something that, that really began in the scientific discourse of the 19th century but was put into place or in practice uh, during the 20th. So if you look in, in uh, I don't know if you have the book with you, but there's a couple of passages that I want to read to you that I think are, are striking in terms of just their terminology. Um, on the very second page of the chapter on Armenia, um, the idea that a sign in 1915 could crop up saying, our Armenian fellow countrymen, because they have attempted to destroy the peace and security of the Ottoman state. Uh, the idea that a group, a minority living within a majority, has attempted to destroy the peace and security of the Ottoman state. You have now to be sent away, have to be sent away to places which they have been prepared in the interior and are literal obedience to the following orders in a categorical manner according, accordingly enjoined upon all Ottomans. One, with the exception of the sick, all Armenians are obliged to leave within five days from the date of this proclamation. Two, although they are free to carry with them on their journey the articles of their movable property, which they desire, they are forbidden to sell their land with extra effects or to leave them here, or to leave them here and there with other people. Um, an extraordinary proclamation, uh, the idea of uprooting a group of people who were at, up until that point citizens of their state, sending them off with basically nothing except what they could carry with them, like a suitcase, and the idea that their property, their civic responsibilities, their citizenship, all of these things had been systematically and inexorably in some sense stripped away, and very quickly, and stripped away because of particular religious beliefs, in this case of the state. It's an amazing parallel, and in many ways a really chilling parallel to what happened in the 1930s with Jewish citizens. The idea, again, of, ha of being asked to leave, of being forced to leave very quickly and being seen or considered to be enemies of the state. At what point does the state change so that citizens, because of a different belief, religious belief, racial um, composition, ethnic uh, affiliation, and so forth, at what point does it shift where the state begins to act against citizens or citizens that were up until that point citizens. So this is a significant parallel and one of the things that the class is about is also looking at these parallels with the Holocaust. One is a precedent in 1915, it's a precedent that Hitler himself recognized. He knew full well that there was a genocide that had taken place, uh, a state sponsored genocide and it was one that he knew to look to not only as a model but also as a model of oblivion, of forgetfulness because it's a genocide which in, 1939, uh, in 1939 was simply not something that people were well aware of. A little further on, and this I think is significant too, um, we have the moment in which the term genocide enters into everyday discourse. And one of the things that had happened uh, in the 1915 period, 1916, 
you have reports that were in United States newspapers, you have reports worldwide, but they didn't know what to call what was happening. There was this kind of confusion about what it was. Is it a race murder? Is it uh, a mass exodus? Is it annihilation? Uh, how do you describe this heretofore unprecedented event? And this is something that they didn't have a term for at the time of the Armenian Genocide. And so the idea that Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jew, who came to the United States in 1940, managed to escape Poland before the real onslaught. Um, he ended up taking a teaching post, actually, at Duke University for a short period of time, and then was a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., uh, working uh, to convince um, members of the government, but also working to convince the UN and others that there was this new crime that was taking place, this new crime against humanity, which he calls genocide. On pages 42 and 43 in this book, um, Lemkin dis defines what genocide is. And I think it's important uh, for us to read a little bit of that, particularly on page 43, because you get a sense in this early period of what he's thinking in terms of why this is new and also what the scope is. So he says, and this is at the top of 43, genocide means a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. So here he's speaking about the result, um, the annihilation of a group. Uh, so remember genus, meaning here a group, a species, a race, an ethnic group, a religious minority. But also the idea that he's talking about the perpetrators, because this is not something that happened haphazardly. It wasn't random. It was coordinated. It was planned. And this aspect is absolutely critical, right? This is an intentional act, not the act of casualties of war, not the act of it just happened, uh, but something that was planned, coordinated, systematically approached. Resources are put into it, human resources, emotional resources, intellectual resources, financial resources, um, transportation resources. This is a critical aspect because you cannot carry out something of this scope, the idea of a genocide, without a tremendous amount of planning. Uh, so calling it a systematic, coordinated plan is very significant. Um, a little further down, uh, and this is the, the paragraph that's indented, he continues by defining genocide as having two phases. One, the destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group, and two, the other, the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. So essentially here, the destruction of whatever makes that particular group unique, their language, their culture, their heritage, um, their customs, their religious practices, whatever, and in place of that, imposing the practices of the majority. So essentially, it's a kind of colonial-like uh, um, approach, um, the national pattern of the oppressor. This imposition, in turn, may be made upon the oppressor po oppressed population, which is allowed to remain sometimes, or upon the territory alone after the removal of the population and the colonization of the area by the oppressor's own nationals. Again, the emphasis here on removal, absolutely critical. Uh, most of the time, they're not allowed to stay. Most of the time, they're rounded up. They're put somewhere, uh, often either in exile, or shipped off, or, um, or destroyed. Finally, at the bottom of that portion, it says, he reflects kind of, I think, uh, pensively, but significantly. It takes centuries and sometimes thousands of years to create a national culture, a natural culture. Lemkin writes, but genocide can destroy a culture instantly, like a fire can destroy a building in an hour. And this is important. Um, this, what we're talking about here, are genocides, almost every single one happened very quickly. Uh, a single year for the Armenian genocide. A couple of years, really we're talking between 1940 and 1945 for the genocide against the Jews. Um, in the case of Cambodia, perhaps a few more years. In the case of Rwanda, we're talking 90 days. An extraordinarily quick efficacious a mobilization of resources and essentially a systematic attack. And so I think he's quite right to say that uh, what takes thousands of hundreds, maybe even thousands of years to build up in terms of a culture can be destroyed instantly by those in power with the will and the means to do so. Okay. A um, couple other things about uh, this. Um, one of the things that will happen as we go through this book, and like I said, we won't read every single um, chapter in here. There's some chapters which I think you could read on your own if you're interested. Other chapters we're simply just not going to have time to get to. But I want you to kind of track and be aware of the comparative aspects. So at what moment here, taking the Holocaust in some ways 
as unique as it is and as significant as that uniqueness is important to preserve, where are parallels to be drawn with other groups? Where are parallels to be drawn with uh, racist policies, annihilation policies, policies of how they were seen or treated, how the groups were treated, how these genocides were carried out? And I think it's important to see where the differences are, but also where the parallels are. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I thought putting the Holocaust in this comparative perspective is something that allows us to understand that it's really something that punctuates, in some ways, the 20th century and the 21st century as well. It's something that certainly in our lifetimes will continue to happen. And I think it's up to us to figure out how, if at all, we decide uh, to react. Any questions or comments on that? Some, all this stuff will be available on the PowerPoint, and it's available on the webcast, so you don't have to worry about every single uh, detail, so you can always easily review. Okay. So I talked a little last time about um, uh, some of the, oops, yeah, the origins of anti-Semitism. And this is necessary for us to understand, actually, let me ask this. Um, is this someone who has a PC that's connected to the internet that actually works right now? Yeah? OK. So what I might do is switch out your computer, if that's OK, because I know it works, right? And then when we look at the film clips, I'll use your computer. Um, that'd be very helpful. What's your name? Tegan? Ann. OK. Super. Thanks, Ann. Um, this is assuming that I can't get back online for whatever reason. Uh, apparently, what happened was this entire system was uh, reinstalled two days ago, and it's affecting yeah everything. Okay. I had uh, mentioned in advance of looking at the Eternal Jew film uh, some of the origins of anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish sentiment, and I thought this was necessary in order for us to understand the stereotypes that were mobilized in the film The Eternal Jew. Um, this was. Um, not the only film that the Nazis created um, to glorify, in some sense, the Nazi state and demonize uh, the Jews. But I think it was, uh, for our purposes here, kind of the, the most obvious condensation of many uh, stereotypes that had existed for a very long time uh, concerning Jews, um, and particularly uh, stereotypes that the Germans wanted to mobilize concerning themselves. Um, so I had mentioned a number of, uh, last time, reasons, uh, origins of anti-Semitism, religious reasons, linguistic, ethnic reasons, national, political, racial, and economic. And I wanted today to actually um, point out some very, kind of give that some, 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 some real uh, historical grounding. And so what I prepared was just two slides that give you some key dates in the history of Jews and anti-Semitism, uh, particularly focused on uh, German um, issues. Um, you know what, I'm going to look here, just real quick, just because I want to, <laughs> I'm just dying to know if it works. Uh, of course not. Yeah. Let's see if I can go to the UCLA WLAN. See if that works, actually. Yeah, I have a feeling what I have to do is actually restart my entire computer to get on, um, to get on the wireless connection because I had tried to get on the, the wired connection to begin with. Um, yeah. We'll just see if this, uh, by some miracle, actually does work. But I'm sure it, I'm sure it won't. Um, OK, well, OK. We, in fact, will use your computer, Ann. OK, so um, first thing, one of the things that the film does, which is extraordinary, is try to figure out why the Jews exist in, or basically it has this idea of why the Jews exist in German-speaking areas in the first place. Uh, that is, uh, why did they come here in the first place? Uh, they weren't, uh, quote, quote unquote, ever welcome. Uh, they didn't belong here. Uh, they must have come from somewhere else, and they're this uh, foreign, uh, alien element. And, and now, not only that, they're also undermining the integrity of uh, German ideals, which are very much rooted in a kind of art, cultural, uh, intellectual, but also very Aryan, white, pure tradition. Um, it's obviously a film which is uh, meant to stage a very clear dichotomy between a kind of purity represented by Aryan Germans and a kind of inferiority a kind of uh, degeneracy, you might say, represented by Jews. 
And it tries to paint this in a historical perspective as well, so that uh, you get a sense that what the narrator is telling you is historically accurate, and we can prove that based on the footage that we've found or, or made uh, concerning real life Jews today. Um, that's basically ostensibly the idea of the film, and the film is meant to be essentially a documentary, or it makes claims to being a documentary, meaning we're going to take our camera and go out into these actual villages and film these Jews and uh, show you that the present day, how they live today, is actually a reflection of a much greater historical uh, problematic. And that historical problematic kind of is the reason why uh, they are as they are today and why they essentially need to be destroyed. Um, that's basically the message of the film. Um, but what I wanted to do was actually point out a number of real kind of historical reasons why anti-Semitism began really centuries ago and provide some background for some of the historical claims the film makes. So very first settlements of Jews in Germanic areas. Um, now Germany interestingly enough, is, is referred in the film as if it's always existed, as if there's always Germany in these German traditions, and then there's these alien groups that come and infiltrate it. But in fact, Germany is a new thing. Germany existed in 1871 onward. Uh, prior to that, there were lots of Germanic regions, there were tribes, there were parts of uh, uh, various uh, tribes affiliated with the Roman Im Holy Roman Empire, uh, there were many different dialects, there was no unified Germany uh, until the late 19th century. Uh, and so even to, I, to have this idea that Germany had existed for hundreds or thousands of years is completely erroneous. Um, the very first settlements of Jews in Germanic areas, meaning where precedence to the German language were spoken, were along the Rhineland uh, in the around 321 to 331 of the Common Era. The Rhineland meaning areas uh, along the Rhine, uh, which today is uh, around the border between France, Switzerland, and Germany. Um, now, one significant thing that resulted in the migration of Jews nor uh, northward uh, was the fact that Christianity became a state religion in the Roman Empire, uh, first articulated under Constantine, then later in 392 uh, as a state religion. Um, now, this is significant because as soon as you have a state declaring an official religion, uh, one of the things that happens generally to minorities or people who don't practice that religion is the sense that uh, their citizenship now is contingent upon or essentially uh, joined with uh, the religion of the state. Um, this is part of the reason why you have a significant number of Jews, at least in the, what we consider the, this, this period in the 4th century, beginning to uh, move northward looking for other, um, other options in terms of uh, jobs, in terms of uh, civic uh, possibilities, but also in terms of just simply life, uh, life possibilities. We're not talking about a significant number of Jews here. We're talking about numbers in the thousands, tens of thousands. Um, but remember, most of Europe is sparsely populated in this period. Uh, the first major, what I would say, uh, first major anti-Semitic moment uh, is probably the Crusades. Um, first one being in 1096, but there were actually a number of Crusades. Different years are given here, 1146, 1189, and so forth. And these are Crusades primarily by folks in Germanic regions uh, making pilgrimages to the Holy Land and along the way attacking uh, non-Christians, attacking Jews and others, uh, and either forcing, by forcing baptism uh, or outright killing of people. Uh, about 5,000 people were killed, uh, primarily Jews, in these uh, crusades. Um, things quiet down for a, a little bit, and then you have a very significant uh, event uh, in the history of Europe, uh, namely the bubonic plague, sometimes called the Black Plague, uh, where Jews, this is probably the first moment where they're scapegoated uh, or blamed uh, for uh, something which is, so to speak, natural. Uh, Jews blamed for poisoning wells, um, and uh, this becomes sort of one, one of the reasons given that Jews become systematically expelled from places where they were tolerated before that. Um, and this happens throughout the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. Uh, Jews who had lived in small towns or principalities, but also uh, larger areas like Brandenburg or Austria or Spain or also England, <laughs> Portugal, uh, were systematically expelled from these cities. Um, or these regions. Um, and so I gave you some dates there. Uh, England was in 1290, um, very famously in Spain in 1492, um, Nuremberg and other places. Um, so 
1543, another significant date, uh, at least within our German history of anti-Semitism, uh, Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, publishes a really infamous and significant tract uh, called The Jews and Their Lies. Um, if I had internet access, I would show you er excerpts from this, and it's on our course links uh, for today. And you can read about this, and it's really quite astounding um, that basically he urges very clearly for the burning of synagogues, and he urges, uh, in fact, the, the, um, for Germans to rise up against the Jews because he's afraid that the Jews are Jewifying Germany, meaning they're taking over. Uh, so there's this sense very early on. This is, you know, 500 years, uh, well, 400 years, sorry, before the Holocaust, uh, that you have already a very articulated uh, anti-Semitism, which is that fear that the Jews are taking over. Um, another stereotype that emerges in the 16th and 17th century, kind of a product of the idea that Jews are expelled, is the idea that Jews are wandering. That is to say, they don't have a national homeland, uh, they're not citizens, they're always on the move, they're moving uh, from country to country or place to place, they're always in exile, they're not native citizens of their host countries. And you get this idea of the wandering Jew um, as a kind of uh, typology of sorts of who Jews are or what they are. This is kind of mixed with the idea of the eternal Jew, which is something that the Nazi film takes up very much. That is, the Jews are eternally considered to be in a certain way. They have these characteristics that are kind of uh, indelible and unchangeable, eternal Jew. And they're also wandering, meaning that they're also, they're never citizens uh, of a country. Um, a significant massacre that happened, uh, probably the biggest massacre of Jews prior to the Holocaust happened shortly after the uh, Thirty Years' War uh, in 1648, uh, which ended in 1648, where you have uh, Jews who had been accepted by Polish princes, uh, particularly because of uh, connections that they had with uh, merc uh, trade and merchants and so forth. They were protected by Polish princes, but when uh, Poland and the Ukraine were uh, essentially in war shortly after the Thirty Years' War, the Jews were caught in the middle and there was a systematic uh, killing uh, of the population, sometimes called uh, the Kalmitsky Massacre of Jews. About 100,000, which is about half the whole population in Central Europe, were killed in this period. Um, more kind of in the modern period, you have a number of major philosophers, particularly German philosophers like Hegel, Fichte, Wagner, uh, the, the, the great musician and, and opera writer, uh, who articulated very anti-Semitic ideas about uh, why Jews were inferior to Germans. Um, and this is, uh, I think, important because the rise of German national feeling was also partly an intellectual aspect, partly philosophical, partly through music, partly through uh, the creative arts. And the idea was that Jews don't create things. They're not, uh, they're not like Germans. They're not deeply philosophical or richly cultural people. But they're people that deal in money and abstractions. And in that way, they hold the, the, uh, the host culture hostage. That's essentially the thinking of, uh, of early Hegel, certainly Wagner, and also some of the nationalist thoughts of someone like Fichte. Um, Outside of Germany, and this is important too because the film doesn't explain why there were all these Jews living in the area of Central Europe, um, Nicholas II, who was the Tsar of Russia in 1835, establishes an area called the Pale of Settlement, which is an area where Jews are allowed to live. Uh, they basically can't, if they leave the Pale of Settlement, they're not allowed re-entry, but it's an area that represents, it goes from um, the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, uh, essentially from Poland, uh, the areas in Central Europe, down to Romania. And this Pale of Settlement is where Jews essentially were restricted to live in the Russian Empire. And in fact, when they were expelled from other major cities like Moscow or St. Petersburg, they were sent there, um, actually on trains. Uh, so it's a kind of precedent uh, for already for the removal of the population and also the management of the Jewish population. At the turn of the 20th century, there are about 5 million Jews living in this area. And this is significant because this is also the majority of where Jews killed in the Holocaust would ultimately be. Uh, so it's this area kind of straddled between Germany and Russia. Um, why this area? Because as Germany expanded both eastward and westward, it absorbed significantly more territory and also significantly more Jews. And so establishing a kind of a way to deal with that uh, then becomes part of uh, the Nazi program, the war program that the Nazis felt uh, that they did for expanding their area was also a war simultaneously against the Jews. A um, couple more things. Uh, the birth of racial anti-Semitism. 
this is really significant. Um, the birth of eugenics, uh, eugenics here, again, there's that word gen, the, the, the etymology of this meaning like beautiful kind or good kind. Uh, race science, the studying of good races uh, or making races stronger, more pure. Uh, the fear of interracial marriage, uh, the fear of uh, the gene pool being, uh, being polluted by people who come from races that are considered to be degenerate. Uh, what are the degenerate races according to the folks in the 1850s? There's certainly races that are Africanized, Jewish, and often quote unquote oriental. Uh, and amazingly, this makes no sense, right? We, we see this today, we're like, this is, this, is, this is completely bunk. But look at the film, uh, which made exactly that point. The most mongrelized races are the Jews because they interbreed with all these other races. And the fear is that they'll become polluted, just like um, other races that they consider to be on the very bottom, uh, which often, almost always, are African races. At the top, European, often German, very white, and an extraordinarily simplistic, and, and obviously racist, but very compelling uh, in the 1850s, and really something that continues to inspire state solutions to deal with uh, degeneracy and the degeneration of races. And by degeneration, we simply mean mixing of races. Uh, the idea is to keep the races pure, because purity is equal to strength, whereas impurity is equal to degeneracy. I should say, by the way, this is something that also permeated the United States. It wasn't something that was only a German or European invention, but you could look to the United States in the 1920s and pretty much these very same ideas about uh, townships pure, of ideas of American ideas about race, uh, fears of uh, Chinese, fears of Filipinos, fears of Mexicans and others coming to the United States and infiltrating white America were something that also characterized early 20th century America. Um, in fact, there were studies that were done in this period that the Nazis actually looked to, studies of eugenics that the Nazis found inspiration uh, that were done by American uh, race scientists in the early 20th century. So it's not something that we just want to demonize as only Nazis, um, but of course, um, what ha ultimately happened in, the, in the Germany was different than what ultimately happened in the US. A um, couple more major dates. Uh, Significant number in the 1880s, 1890s, pogroms, uh, basically riots against Jewish villages in the Pale of Settlement. These happen uh, forcing many Jews to migrate uh, westward, uh, migrate into Germany, migrating into France, the United States. And so the significant number of Jews that came to the United States came between 1880 and 1910, 1920. Um, and um, this gave rise to major populations, Jewish centers like in London and New York, eventually LA. Um, and it also gave rise to a tremendously new anti-Semitism in Germany, which is that the Jews were often, often impoverished Jews, uh, were coming into Germany, and the Jews, as Heinrich von Treitschke, a very famous German um, essayist, said, the Jews are our misfortune, the Juden sind unser Unglück. This is 1880. That becomes the banner of the Nazi party in 1933. Um, it's an extraordinary thing because that phrase wasn't invented by the Nazis. It was invented, it was invented decades earlier, at the end of the 19th century, uh, to talk about uh, mig waves of migration of Jews that were coming into Germany. And so one of the things here that's important is that migration uh, presents a very real problem uh, for Germans in this period. And I would argue migration has always presented a problem for uh, people who consider themselves the majority an anxiety against uh, foreignness, an anxiety against people who speak a different language, who have different color skin, who uh, practice different religion. Um, all of these things are at stake in 1880 uh, in Germany and certainly just come back to the fore in the 1930s. In the 20th century, a couple of major things that gave rise to the Nazi party. Uh, these are things that are, um, this, is, this is all prior to the chronology that's in your course reader. There's a very, one of the things that if this stuff is not that, if you don't know what happened in Nazi Germany that well, so this period between 1933 and 1945, I have provided you with a day, well, very, it's almost day by day, uh, chronology of uh, Nazi Germany in the course reader. And this is something that you do want to uh, familiarize yourself with extensively. But uh, my chronology here is obviously significantly before 1933 because a lot of these things had precedents um, that, uh, that in many ways the Nazi party built upon. <coughs> um, World War I. This is, uh, 
This is the first time in the 20th century that Jews are explicitly targeted for not uh, serving the German nation. Uh, Jews served in the military in Germany. Uh, tens of thousands of Jews served. They fought on the battle lines for Germany. Uh, they fought in the trenches. They flew airplanes and did combat sorties and other things. Um, in 1916, when the tide was changing against Germany winning the war, uh, anti-Semitism continued to break out in Germany, and they decided that they wanted to take a, a census of how many Jews were serving in the military and what they were doing. Um, it was a very, very much anti-Semitically motivated census, what they called a Jew count, uh, literally counting the number of Jews and what they were doing. Uh, and the idea was they tried to prove, and they never really, they did by no means prove this, that the Jews actually had stabbed Germany in the back, that they were traitors. Uh, and by 1920, this myth had taken over that the Jews had caused Germany's defeat in the First World War. Um, there were virtually no Jewish traitors, as far as we know historically. Um, there were not Jews who were undermining Germany or fighting for the other side, um, but actually a significant number of Jews who were decorated, who were war victims, who received the Iron Cross, and who died on the battlefront serving Germany uh, in exactly the same numbers as other groups who also served Germany. Um, nevertheless, this was the basis of the birth of the Nazi Party. Uh, the Nazi Party was not something that existed for a very long time. It was established in 1920. Uh, it was established specifically after the First World War, after Germany's defeat, and the idea of trying to find um, a way, an explanation of sorts, uh, for the down for Germany's defeat. Um, Hitler, uh, you may know, uh, tried to stage a, a small little coup uh, in Munich in 1923. He was arrested. Um, he had these at the time considered completely uh, bizarro ideas about taking over uh, the idea of uh, a new, introducing a new right-wing party, a nationalist party. Uh, he writes Mein Kampf, his book called My Struggle While in Jail, uh, publishes it shortly thereafter. It's full of anti-Semitic stereotypes and tirades, uh, basically against uh, how Jews have undermined Germany. Uh, goes on for hundreds of pages in this vein. No one takes it really very seriously, or very few people take it seriously. Um, but the tide shifts dramatically at the end of the 1920s and the early 30s. A number of reasons why the tide shifts, partially because of the economic uh, uh, downturn in this period. You, you remember uh, this is the, beginning of the, the beginnings of the Great Depression. Um, Germany had been very, uh, a very fractured place, politically very fragmented, socially very fragmented, following the First World War. Um, it is a place where people were looking for answers, quite honestly. Uh, they were looking for new beginnings. And they were also looking for, and probably somewhat more receptive to very racist, uh, under, racist explanations uh, for why Germany was defeated and why Hitler uh, kind of conceived of himself and also marketed himself as someone who could save and rebuild Germany. A spectacular rise in the Nazi party between 1928 and 32. They gained the majority in the Reichstag uh, in 1932, which is the German parliament. Um, prior to that, they had always been a very fringe minority. So a very quick rise to power, uh, which is very interesting. Um, so it's one of those things that you say it couldn't happen here. It couldn't happen here. How could it possibly happen here? Um, I wouldn't be so quick to say that, um, simply because history has proven time and time again that sometimes in these great moments of desperation and looking for answers, sometimes uh, someone on the very far fringe becomes the center. And that's exactly what happened in, in 1933. Hitler sworn in as Chancellor of Germany on January 30th, and 30th 1933, and immediately a number of very significant anti-Jewish um, anti-Jewish uh, actions happen uh, throughout uh, Germany. The most significant is just shortly after the boycotting of all Jewish businesses, Nazis calling for uh, no Germans to shop or patronize Jewish businesses. Um, a massive book burning taking place in Berlin in May 10th, 1933, where they haul the books out of the uh, University of Berlin, the library. They take them out, all the Jewish books, all the books written by homosexuals and books written by socialists, and they burn them in a massive conflagration. Uh, Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister of Germany, presides over this, uh, basically saying uh, that now we're finally cleansing Germany of the filth uh, that had been, uh, had it been there for, for so long. The very first concentration camp opens just the same year. Uh, amazingly, it's already becoming clear what they want to do. 
they established a concentration camp outside of Munich called Dachau in 1933, where political prisoners and dissidents to the Nazi state are sent. Uh, first prisoners there are in 1933. Other concentration camps are established shortly thereafter and outside of other major cities. Bergen-Belsen is established outside of Hamburg. Sachsenhausen established outside of Berlin. And uh, these camps become places for dissidents, people who are against the Nazi state or who embody something the Nazi state doesn't consider to be um, in line with its racial ideas. The first people, by the way, sent to most of these camps, political dissidents, homosexuals, and gypsies. Um, Jews, a little bit later. Uh, particularly after 1938. Um, 1935, um, a very significant other turning point that you need to be aware of, the institution of the Nuremberg Laws um, in the city, in some ways, I'm pointing to the long history of Nuremberg as an anti-Semitic uh, stronghold. Um, Jews are deprived of their citizenship. Uh, it's an amazing thing to basically say that this minority has now, they're no longer citizens of the state. Uh, they're subjects to the state, but they're not citizens. That means they can't vote, they can't hold civic office, they can't run for office, they can't patronize um, anything that has to do with the state, like public services, um, and they can't intermarry with Germans. Uh, all that's forbidden as of September 1935. Um, 1938, this is the last moment kind of in the history of anti-Semitism before um, the onslaught of the Holocaust. You have a systematic pogrom, again, a kind of massive riot. This fits very well in terms of what uh, Lemkin calls coordinated action, because this is a coordinated action throughout all of Germany um, to burn synagogues, burn businesses, um, to collect uh, and round up Jews, uh, and to send them to concentration camps. Um, approximately 30,000 Jews sent to concentration camps um, KZ, by the way, is the German abbreviation for concentration camp. In German, it's Konzentrationslager, um, spelled like that. So KZ or Lager, uh, that just means concentration camp. You'll see in uh, L.E. Wiesel and other people will talk about a Lager, and that simply just means a camp. Uh, so it means a camp, a place, of deport a place where people who are deported, uh, where they're taken. Um, so that's, uh, that's the history here of anti-Semitism. Now, this is, uh, I said it's a little bit s simplified, but I think it gives you enough to go on in order to understand the film uh, in 1940. Um, we only have about 15 minutes left, but I do want to spend a little bit of time analyzing and talking about the rhetoric in the film. And um, one of the things that I think is uh, particularly important is to recognize that this film was created uh, in 1940 for the German uh, public. Now, the war had already started. Uh, the, war was, the Second World War was already underway. Uh, in fact, Germany had already invaded Poland and had already controlled Polish territories where they acquired approximately three million Jews uh, into the German Nazi uh, empire at that period. And this film was produced for the German-speaking public uh, in Germany. It was widely screened in major cities. Um, it wasn't uh, the most widely received film. Um, it wasn't something that people stood in lines to see. However, it was seen by millions of people. And uh, it was created in order to give some justification to the German people as to why what was about to happen or what was happening was justified historically. Um, the film calls itself a documentary, and I mean, in calling it the eternal Jew and having it um, narrated by, obviously, a German-speaking person with music in the background, which gives a kind of sense about the, for, uh, the forebodingness of the Jewish threat and its uh, contradistinction to the ideals of Germany, certainly it's meant, in many ways, to... Um, to provide a kind of clear conscience, you might say, uh, to the German people, um, and also to provide some reason, historical rationale, why the an their anti-Semitism is justified. Um, one of the things the film does that I think is really extraordinary is it uses a tremendous number of statistical means to try to prove this, uh, and visuals, uh, maps, uh, in this case, a map of Europe uh, where Jews had moved, um, it uses statistical information that the, the film never gives any indication as to where it came from, about uh, all the things that Jews are involved with. And it also uses footage uh, that uh, was filmed, so to speak, on location in Poland, but also footage that Jews themselves had made basically against the Jews. 
And so all these things meaning to kind of put the film in this genre of an expose, uh, in some ways more than a documentary, um, because a documentary is ostensibly objective. And this film is ostensibly trying to be objective too. Um, so we kind of need to evaluate that uh, with, a, with a grain of salt. So one of the things I wanted to show you was one of the very first uh, explanations of the, of the Jews. And of course, uh, what's interesting about this particular one, so a couple of things that are interesting here. As they, they point out the way that Jews did make their way to various uh, European areas, give no explanation of that big area there, the Pale of Settlement, um, as in that was not so much a place of choice, but a place in which they're restricted to settling. And then here, the idea that they're, of course, not just a foreign element, but they're dangerous. And they're dangerous because of the ambitions that they have to take over the world. And, of course, a world map a world map showing all these glowing areas will show that. And then we have this extraordinary parallel um, that the film establishes between Jews and rats. Interestingly here, it's always Europe that's being invaded by something. Right? So it starts, either the Jews begin in the Middle East and come to Europe, or the rats begin in Asia and come to Europe, and then they spread out over the entire world. The fear, of course, is that Europe, its integrity has been somehow invaded or compromised. And then you have these extraordinary scenes that the Jews are basically, essentially, just like rats. Carrying disease, carrying destruction, carrying uh, malnourishment, plagues, and so forth. A very long-standing stereotype but then becomes visualized very powerful in the film by this, uh, by this connection. The idea that Jews had undermined uh, German culture becomes such a, a significant part of this film. And one of the things that they do a number of times in this film is con contrapose um, European culture. Uh, and often European culture is really not even just German. It's uh, Italian, Italian Renaissance. Um, it's this kind of sculptural tradition of the great male and in some ways also the great female body. It's the great musical traditions. Uh, it's the traditions of Greco-Roman antiquity, uh, which the Germans and the Nazis emulated. And they saw these traditions as part of their own, even though in fact they really weren't, um, certainly not a, a direct lineage. Nevertheless, in the film, it's as if Germany is a direct descendant of this uh, tradition of this great moments in Greek and Roman antiquity, of these great moments in the Renaissance, that the kind of art and culture and music and ways of thinking about society, that these things were all German and that they had been poisoned by Jews. Question? It does almost make the Germans seem kind of godlike. And that's, I think, exactly the point, is that it establishes a sense of their superiority that it, this is a, a kind of a long-standing, and this is where I wanted it to go, uh, a long-standing idea that the Germans were the culmination of some kind of uh, direction of civilization, and that the Jews were not by any means the culmination, but they were the thing that was standing in the way of. And so we get then images like this. Um, and these are very interesting because the Nazis, just two years earlier, had staged a massive exhibition of art in Nazi Germany, um, in Munich and other cities called Degenerate Art, where they basically paraded all the great works of modernist art um, from Picasso um, to Gauguin to Dix and others, um, put it up in a museum in order to make fun of it. Uh, basically, and say what they've done, uh, modern art, basically between 1900 and, say, 1925 or so, all of this, these works of art by uh, Jews and non-Jews, but some of which is sponsored by uh, Jewish museums and others, Paul Klee, uh, Katie Kollwitz, I mean, major figures in the history of art are put up in this museum in order to show their degeneracy. And not only that, they also want to make a point, they make in the film here, that not only do Jews su support this kind of degenerate art, which doesn't look like the classical tradition, but they also support things like jazz, and they also support things like African music and African traditions. 
And this becomes a very big problem for the Nazis again because of the idea that this is considered to be some kind of bastardization of the purity of the Nazi state. So watch as the film kind of plays out here. Um, let's go ahead and make this larger. Here are these uh, really a number of significant moments in the history of modernism. Uh, mm -hmm. and this is amazing, is where you have now a splicing together. Even the, in the film here, you have almost a kind of modernist technique being used. You might see this as a kind of montage, where you have uh, the African performer in the back, the artworks in the front, the kind of the two blending together. The idea as if they're all the same lineage, as if uh, this is all the stuff that needs to be rejected. This is all the stuff that's impacted all the things that have compromised the integrity of German racist, uh, German racial integrity, or German, German, Germany as a superior race. Um, so ex extraordinary. Let me. Okay. So I'm going to show you one last segment here because there's one other thing that I want to make sure we get to today. And that is the moment of uh, the moment of sort of Aryan superiority in the film. And so you can talk about the ritual slaughter um, in sections. I'm not going to go into that right now. But I do want to go to the part where they glorify Germany. And I talk a little bit about the imagery that's here. Um, this is uh, Hitler giving the speech where he calls for the destruction of the Jews in Europe in 1939. Uh, this is actual footage uh, of that speech. Um, let me go back and let it run. So this is uh, one of the major speeches that he gave uh, shortly before the start of the Second World War. Uh, the applause that he gains by calling for the Vernichtung of the Jewish race of Europe. This is spliced with footage that actually comes from Leni Riefenstahl, a film that she made in 1934, uh, of adoration of crowds uh, outside um, at major, um, at major uh, speaking events that Hitler undertook in the 1930s throughout Germany. And here you have the image, the profiles of the kind of ideal Aryan man uh, and ideal Aryan woman. These profiles always shadowed, often from the side rather than straight on. Uh, this idea of the blonde, the, the German, this uh, sense of kind of destiny or staring, the sense that uh, by no means poisoned or made degenerate by uh, the so-called Jewish, um, the, the so Jewish vermin. Um, here you have these profiles of ideal German women. And again, talking about the purity of our race. Uh, the purity of the race is a legacy that has to be protect, protected at this becoming really the driving force of what Nazi ideology uh, is all about, bringing the racial idea to the idea of the state, slightly. But what you finally see is, and I think this is important to underscore, are just a tremendous number of adoring masses behind this. Uh, and this is something that Hitler continuously tried to do. He utilized the medium of film and deployed the medium of film as a way of not just distributing racial ideas and essentially trying to create a sort of um, a, a kind of homogeneity in terms of what German belief was about, um, but also as a way in a way of consolidating and carrying out that belief in very real political means. So the medium of film becomes a way of really trying to put into practice racist ideas. And you certainly see this, I think, in this film and other films that were created in this period. Um, good. So yeah, let me apologize again for our, our internet problem today. We'll definitely get it resolved by Tuesday. What we'll do uh, for Tuesday, you have sections on Friday. Um, sections, uh, obviously, of TAs. You have papers due on Friday. All this stuff is posted already. And um, we'll see you on Tuesday.